Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so I'm going to try to cram the next two decades into about 12 to 15 minutes, so hold on to your chairs. So I'm the chief futurist for Cisco and um, also the CTO for one of our business functions. And Cisco often talks about what we make. We don't often talk about what we make possible. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about the future of ICT, and let's sort of take a look back to see where we're going. So let's set the stage first. So it should be no surprise that we're living in exponential times. In fact, in the next 50 years, 95% of everything we know will be discovered in those 50, across almost every discipline, material sciences, physics, chemistry. We are learning at exponential rates. Human knowledge is doubling on average every decade, in some fields much, much faster than that. Some of you may know Ray Kurzweil. He has postulated that the century we're in now will have a 1,000 times as much innovation as the century that we just left. And if we just take a few of the pillars of technology to illustrate some of these trends, you know, computing essentially is becoming free. I have in the center there a musical greeting card. It's about a $5 card. That card has 800 times more processing power than the first general, pers first general purpose computer, the ENIAC, I had a few decades ago. If I could have bought that amount of computing power in 1946, oops, hang on, um, it would have cost me $4.4 billion for that greeting card. And over the course of the next couple of decades, $1 will buy the equivalent processing power of the human brain, about 100 trillion calculations per second. So it's conceivable to think that in a decade or two, when you open up that musical greeting card, it will do face recognition, it will connect to the cloud, um, it will have biometrics, it will have the compute power of a human brain, and will cost about a dollar. Storage is following the same trend. In 1956, a gigabyte of memory cost $78 million. This iPhone with uh, 64 gig is equivalent to about $6 billion worth of storage alone. Today, storage is, is pennies for a gigabyte. And over the course of the next few decades, fractions of a, a penny uh, for, um, for storage. And in fact, by 2030, you'll be able to buy 11 petabytes of storage for $100. You'll be able to record every second of your entire life in Blu-ray quality uh, HD for about $100. And people have already begun that process. The network is exploding at exponential rates. The number of things, Internet of Things, doubles about every five and a bit years. So today we have roughly 10 billion devices connected to the Internet. Five years from now, it'll be 20 billion. So that's how we get to this sort of 25 to 50 billion dollar, or 50 billion number. We are now in an era of a network of things, not people. It's no longer about people. There are a lot more things, five times as many things connected to the Internet as there are people today. It's about two billion people connected to the Internet today. That number will double in the next four years alone. By 2050, uh, sorry, by about 2020, about 50 billion devices connected to the Internet. And 50 billion could be just the beginning. We're seeing uh, fabrication and miniaturization of computing devices, millimeter-sized computing devices with processors and, and solar cells and uh, communication capabilities. We're seeing cameras not much bigger than a hypodermic needle and sensors where hundreds can fit on the tip of your finger. As you start to combine these capabilities together, we start to see billions of devices that can sense our world and can communicate amongst themselves. And it's not just the traditional things that are getting connected. It's the things we didn't expect. So whether it's the tree in Brussels that tweets or cows that generate 200 megabytes of information per year on their pedigree and dietary habits, or it's shoes or asthma inhalers, or even pills that you swallow that broadcast to a Band-Aid or a plaster on your stomach, which in turn broadcasts to your physician using a mobile phone. So we're seeing all sorts of devices that we did not expect to get connected, get connected to the Internet. All of these things are creating massive amounts of data. And this poses an opportunity and a challenge at the same time. In 2008, we created about five exabytes of new information. In one year, we created more new information than in the previous 5,000 years. And yet, three years later, that number skyrocketed to about 1.2 zettabytes. To give you a visual, if you could build a bookshelf from Earth to Pluto and back 20 times, that's how much data we're creating on an annualized basis right now. 90% of it is video. Uh, where's it all coming from? I think we know a lot of the sources, social media, I mean, YouTube, 60 hours of video uploaded every single minute. Facebook, the largest repository of photos anywhere on the planet, 140 billion photos. Hundreds of billions of email messages sent every single day. And by 2015, a million video minutes will traverse the network every single second. And all of this is moving to the cloud. So when we think about cloud, you know, we often think, 
you know, taking our applications and our infrastructure and moving it off-site to a different location for convenience. And that's valuable, but it's perhaps a, uh, an additional promise to the cloud, and that's that it brings new capabilities to devices that are simply connected. It turns every one of these devices into a supercomputer. And let me illustrate a few. So language translation. We're on the verge of universal language translation. In the coming years, you will pick up your phone, speak the language of your choice, the person on the receiving end will hear it in the language of their choice, and vice versa. Why? Because it's all done in the cloud. The cloud does a computational heavy lifting, and devices with a connection to the cloud can tap into that. We see uh, computational knowledge engines like uh, Wolfram Alpha, uh, the Khan Academy, where there are thousands of videos online in just about every subject you can imagine. 171 million lessons already served. That's the equivalent of every person in Britain taking three lessons online from the Khan Academy. Um, and then we're seeing supercomputers like IBM's Watson move into other fields, like uh, getting its medical degree, getting its legal degree. What happens when these types of devices get connected to the cloud. When you issue a query, instead of getting hundreds of millions of results back, you get one result back, and it's the right result every time based on the context of which you ask. So the cloud brings with it supercomputing to any device that has a connection. And by the way, the, the converse of that, uh, which I just skipped over, is quite profound. Those with no connection will be severely disadvantaged going forward. This, for those of you that don't recognize it, is a VCR. That we used to record movies on this device. The reason I put this uh, device up is to illustrate another trend, and that is that technology for the first time is adapting to us. We have always had to adapt to technology, and the VCR is an example. How many of you had a VCR with a 12 o'clock blinked all the time? Why? Because you didn't know how to change it. You had to adapt to the machine. You had to figure out the UI to change it. For the first time ever, because of Moore's Law, because of connectivity, because of intelligence in the cloud, technology is finally adapting to us on our own terms. What do I mean by that? So machines are learning to see. And I don't mean see barcodes, QR codes. I mean see like we see, see objects. Uh, you can take your phone and point it at a Sudoku puzzle, and it will solve that puzzle for you. Uh, you can gesture to technology. You can use your voice. Uh, we're seeing digital uh, signage solutions that do emotion recognition, that do face recognition, that do age recognition, and serve up content based on who you are, where you are, what you're doing, and the context of uh, your sex and, and age and so on. So technology is adapting to us. And we're even controlling technology with our thoughts, with our mind. Over the course of the next couple of decades, we'll see brain implants become commonplace. But today, you can get uh, brain implants that allow you to control external devices. Toyota, for example, has a wheelchair that a paraplegic can control just by thinking about it. There are force feedback or closed loop feedback prosthetic devices that you can control with your mind. And then you get a sensory input back to your brain, like using our mind to control devices in our environment. And one of the other big trends we're seeing is an era of huge, huge innovation. It's sort of this anything on demand. This is this notion of 3D printing that I want to talk about briefly. So we've seen a logical progression from you know, downloading a book or a movie or music. We think nothing of that now. But what about physical goods? We can download music or books because they're digital. Things are becoming digital. In the future, we will download things, physical objects, as easily as we will download music today. Uh, this is additive manufacturing. Very quickly, for those of you not familiar with it, with subtractive manufacturing, you start with a block of something, aluminum, steel, you machine away the parts you don't need until you're left with the product that you do. With additive manufacturing, you print layer by layer by layer, millions of times, until you're left with the thing that you care about. And today, about 40 different types of materials can be printed. Uh, of interest here is the bicycle from the European Air Defense System. This is a bicycle you can print and then ride it out of the building. So about 40 things, you, know, you can print aluminum, you can print steel, you can print plastics, polycarbs, pretty sophisticated things. Airbus believes that by 2050, they will print entire planes in hangar-sized 3D printers. So being able to print all sorts of interesting products. Uh, from the very small to the very big, the um, St. Stephen's Cathedral there in Vienna is 100 nanometers in size on this slide. That's the width of a human hair. So it gives you a sense of the resolution at which we can now print. In the coming years, we will print devices that will literally crawl out of the machine after they're printed. Uh, and from the very small to the very big, companies like D-Shape are printing homes. We will send these devices to the moon, to Mars, to print habitats for hum humans prior to their arrival. And what about us? Dr. Anthony Atala at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine 
has pioneered a technique to print human organs. So while it may be a few decades before, before we can routinely print organs because of trials and testing and so on, this is from a proof of principle perspective, this is where we're going. Uh, the big promise here is the time and cost savings. This is a turboprop engine life size. And instead of spending 900,000 and taking nine months to print this, it took them 20, or cost them 25,000 and one and a half months to print. The time and cost savings are significant. And 3D printers are following the same price curve as 2D printers. A million dollar 3D printer in 2006 will cost less than $1,000 in 2020. We'll think nothing of having a 3D printer in our home like we have a fridge, washing machine, microwave today. So how are we going to handle all this, this onslaught of data and new technology? Well, we'll add additions to the family tree. The first is artificial people. These are not avatars. These are completely synthetic virtual people that, for all intents and purposes, are human. You can see the progression of the, of the interfaces in the last decade alone. Emily from Image Metrics, you will not be able to differentiate from human. You can look at that video online on YouTube. And coupled with the back-end supercomputing capability in the cloud, we will create virtual people. We will also work alongside more and more robotic um, devices, certainly in the white collar place. These are not just for manufacturing anymore. 17 million robots on the planet today, doubling every two and a half years. Robots in various forms will outnumber humans by 2030. And by about 2030, will also become superior to us from a men mentality uh, perspective. And then the last thing I'll leave you with, more from a provocative um, sort of uh, forecast, is we are starting to self-design ourselves. We are starting to move into an era of self-evolution. And there's very few parts of the human body today that we are not either augmenting or repairing or replacing, and this trend will just continue. Some uh, futurists, scientists, believe that the first person to live to a 1,000 has already been born. There's little doubt in my mind that any child born today will live to be two to 300 years old, and that's a conservative estimate. Humans are going to start living a lot longer. So what does it all mean from a user perspective? Well, all the world's knowledge and all the world's services will be available to anyone with a connection. No connection, huge disadvantage. Technology is finally adapting to us. It will be everywhere and yet nowhere at the same time. And we're entering an era of massive hyper-innovation. So Britain is in an amazing position to capitalize on this. And then, as I mentioned, humans are going to start living a lot longer and have a much, much better quality of life. And of course, from a networking perspective, we believe that none of this can be enabled without the network. So the network matters now, but not nearly as much as it will in the future. So with that, I think I just got in under the 15-minute mark. So thank you very much.